How's it guys and welcome back to our Tenfold Live Show. My name is Philippa and I'm here to bring you one of many, many episodes that we are going to bring you proudly sponsored by Liberty. This is a great show. We're going to be focusing on maths and physical sciences. So if you feel like your matric is a little bit out of touch, we're here to help you. This week we're focusing on 2D and 3D trigonometry, but next week guys, we move on to factoring polynomials, that remainder theorem and the zero theorem, all of that stuff that you need to know about cubic functions and all of that jargon which is like really scary in math sometimes so guys i'm going to encourage you please send in your questions because if you get featured on our live show next week you win a 19 inch tv which is really rad so you guys really should send in your questions anyway getting back to the show we run from 5 p.m until 6 p.m monday to thursday so make sure you tune in also if you feel like you need a little extra punt for your matric come and download our tenfold education app also brought to you by liberty it's got some great videos on there guys we've got lessons examples concept videos even career videos that yet let you apply your maths outside the classroom so please guys download our app it's really there for your help we've put together some fantastic content but for now, we're going to get into an intro video because we're focusing on 2D and 3D trig. So let's check that out. Trigonometry is used extensively in many different fields. It is a branch of mathematics that is not only useful, but fascinating too. Trigonometry improves critical thinking, geometrical reasoning, and problem-solving abilities. In the 2D and 3D trigonometry module, we take you back to the basics with revision of similar triangles and ratios, trigonometric ratios, special angles, solving triangles, finding angles, defining trig ratios on the Cartesian plane, the cast diagram, reduction formulae, trigonometric identities, and general solution. To be successful at 3D trigonometry problem solving, you will need to understand the concepts of solving triangles using 2D trigonometry principles and solving triangles using 3D trigonometry principles. Trigonometry is roughly 40 plus minus 3 marks in the final exam, which is approximately 27% of Maths Paper 2. Hey guys, so hopefully that's helped introduce you to our 2D and 3D trig. For now, we're going to take a question that was sent in by someone who wanted to be anonymous because sometimes it's scary to put your stuff out there on TV. So let's see what they have to say. Hi, Tenfold. Um, there's this question that is really difficult for me to do. Can you please help me if you can see it? Um, also, I'd like to send a shout out to my friends, Rofiwa, Deba, Jolo, Precious. I love you guys. Thank you. Bye. Okay, guys, you see, it's as easy as that. Send in a video of your question, whatever you need help with, just send it through. This is a really cool question because it's got some basic 2D and 3D stuff in it. So it's going to help me help you. Let's have a look at what this question is. It says in the diagram below, BC is a pole anchored by two cables at A and D. AD and C are in the same horizontal plane. The height of the pole is H and the angle of elevation from A to the top of the pole B is beta. They also give us that angle ABD is equal to two beta and the length BA is equal to the length BD, which we haven't indicated on our diagram. So I'm going to do that here. Okay, so it's determine the distance AD between the anchors in terms of H. Okay, so in terms of H, we're looking specifically and we're trying to find this length. Okay, so guys, when we're given a question like this that involves two different triangles, basically we're trying to test whether or not you can see that the length we're trying to find is in one triangle, but there's not enough information in that triangle to find that length. So you need to work from one triangle, find a common ground and move into the next triangle. So let's see if we can do that. Okay, so I can see immediately that the length AD forms part of this triangle here. We've got B there given to beta here and we're given that these two lengths are equal. Definitely not enough information. So if I draw out the other triangle, I've got this lovely 90 degree triangle here. 
B, C, given to us is H, this angle is beta, and that is A. Okay, so already to find a common ground, I can see that A, B are common lengths. So to link the two triangles, let's try and find an expression of A, B from this triangle. Okay, well we have the opposite side, we're trying to find the hypotenuse, so we use the sine ratio. So we've got sine of beta is equal to opposite, which is H, over AB. If we make AB the subject of the formula, we get that is equal to H over sine of beta. Okay, so now we have a little bit more information up here. We say that this is H over sine of beta. Now remember, these two were given as equal, so this is also H of sine of beta. Okay, so now guys, if you look here, automatically angles of a triangle tell me that we have 180 degrees is equal to 2 beta plus twice angle A, because over here these angles are equal because that's an isos triangle. Okay, so that means that beta plus angle A is equal to 90 degrees, which means that angle A is equal to 90 degrees minus beta. So that's this angle over here. Alrighty, so if I look at the amount of information I have, I have an expression for a side opposite its angle, and we're trying to find this side here opposite another given angle. Sign rule. Automatically, guys, sign rule. So AB over the sine of its opposite angle, which is 2 beta, is equal to, well, we found an expression for side, let's say, BD over here, which is H over sine of beta. Remember, that's the expression for the whole length there, so we need to still put it over the sine of its opposite angle, which is this angle here, which we found over here to be 90 minus beta. Okay, so we get sine of 90 minus beta. Okay, let's continue to work with this situation here. A, B, well, we can expand sine of 2 beta to be sine of beta multiplied by cos of beta, all doubled. It's equal to H over sine of beta. And remember your co-ratio, sine of 90 minus beta is equal to cos of beta. Okay, so let's continue to work with this. Now if we make AB the expression or the subject of the formula, we get H multiplied by 2 sine of beta cos of beta all over sine of beta multiplied by cos of beta. This will cancel, that will cancel. So we end up with AB is equal to 2H and that is in terms of H which is perfect. So hopefully this has helped you guys get into the show, start working with 2D and 3D trigonometry. It's really helped me understand a little bit more. We as teachers still do learn more stuff when we do this with you. So yeah, hopefully that's a great first question that you guys have encountered with us. For now, we're gonna hop into a concept video focusing on 2D and 3D trigonometry. And after that, Julian will be taking another question. So stay tuned. Since ancient times, mankind turned their heads skyward and found meaning in observed cosmic events. Interested in the position of heavenly bodies and the movement of the galaxy, one of the first sciences, astronomy, was developed. Mathematics was the fundamental tool that made exploring planetary motion and astronomical interpretation a reality. And some of the greatest breakthroughs in mathematics were made during the study of the stars. The origins of trigonometry can be traced back to the study of astronomy. The two main branches of trigonometry are plane trigonometry and spherical trigonometry. Plane trigonometry studies the relationship between the sides and angles of a triangle where the vertices are located on a flat plane. This is the type of trigonometry you're introduced to at school. Spherical trigonometry deals with curved triangles drawn on the surface of a sphere. This branch of trigonometry, which is used extensively in astronomy and navigation, 
enables astronomers to project the spherical heavens onto a flat surface for mapping. The positioning of heavenly bodies has always been at the core of astronomy. How do astronomers measure these heavenly distances which lie beyond the reach of measuring instruments? One of the most accurate methods used is called parallax. To understand what parallax is, try this. Place the index finger of your hand in front of your nose. It doesn't matter which hand. First, close your left eye and look at your finger with your right eye. Then close the right eye and look at your finger with your left eye open. What do you notice? Your finger appears to change position compared to the objects in the background. This effect is called parallax. Parallax describes the apparent change in position of an object against a fixed background due to the angle which the object is viewed from. In astronomy, this effect is called trigonometric parallax. The apparent movement of your finger in front of your face has a simple explanation. Your eyes are in different positions on either side of your face, hence they have different lines of sight to your finger. The difference in the angles due to the line of sight is the parallax, and the distance between your eyes is the baseline. The size of the parallax angle is proportional to the length of the baseline. By using parallax, the distance of the baseline and trigonometry, astronomers can measure the distances to some stars and other objects in our galaxy without leaving the solar system. Stars are astronomically far away from the Earth. As the distance to a star increases, the parallax decreases. Astronomers know that if the parallax angle is too small to measure because the object is too far away, they have to increase the distance between the vantage points of the baseline. Since a star is so far away, its parallax is so small that using a short baseline like the distance from one eye to another will never work. We need a massive baseline to measure from. We have just that in the diameter of the orbit of the Earth. The distance from the Earth to the Sun, the closest star to Earth, is one astronomical unit, or AU, which is roughly 150 million kilometers. Hence, the diameter of the orbit of the Earth is 2 AU, or approximately 300 million kilometers. This is the baseline used to measure the distance to a star. The method of trigonometric parallaxes used to calculate the distance to nearby stars involves observing how the position of a nearby star seems to change as the Earth is in different positions in its orbit around the Sun. The line of sight to an observed star in December is different from the line of sight in June, when the Earth is on the other side of its orbit. The positions of the observed star, Earth and the Sun, make up the vertices of a triangle. Using trigonometry, the triangle is solved to determine the distance to the star. The angular shift, parallax, is one angle of a triangle, and the distance between the two vantage points, the baseline, is one side of the triangle. Since we have the length of the baseline, 2AU, and can measure the parallax of the star, we can calculate the distance to the star. The majority of stars appear to maintain the same relative position for long periods. In fact, constellations identified by our ancestors are still seen today. So the observed star that we wish to know the distance to will not change its position significantly in the six months it is under observation. The closest star to our solar system is called Proxima Centauri, and it's about 4.25 light years, or 40.2 trillion kilometers away. The Scottish astronomer Robert Innes, who at that time was the director of the Union Observatory in Johannesburg, South Africa, discovered it in 1915. Whilst interstellar travel at this stage may seem like science fiction, one thing is certain. If travelling to the stars were to someday become science fact, mathematics would be fundamental in achieving that reality.